board. Hello everyone, I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have Cassandra Aho here with Midnight Midwifery Consulting. I always have to look because all the M's and the, I'm like, I want to say the midwifery right in the mid, yeah. So um, Cassandra, thank you again for being with me. How, how's the little one doing? Oh, thank you for having me. He's perfect, growing like a chunk. How old is he again? Um, he will be four months this month. So time yeah. flies. It'll be fun. You'll look at these videos years from now and he's screaming around and be like, yes, <laughs> you were on my videos. Yes. So, uh, um, so yeah, so tell us a little bit about your services and your background and then we'll get into our questions we talked about. Perfect. So, um, in my midnight midwifery, look, I get all blundered too when I say it fast. Um, <laughs> I mostly what I do it on the consulting end is um, meet with people that may have concerns about either individual clients um, that could be experiencing intimate partner violence, or I tend I do practice overhaul. That's what I like to call it. Um, so I sit down and take a look at protocols and resources that that midwives already have available in their practices and determine how safe they are. Um, do we need to up that? Because getting those resources together is, is a lot of work. I mean, it takes sometimes hours to just connect with the right person. Um, so that's what I do. I take that burden away. Um, and I find resources specific to the community that you're in. And I do, uh, if there are domestic violence shelters, uh, meeting, even uh, speaking to the police departments locally to determine if they have uh, a victim advocacy, advocacy task force. Um, not all police departments do, but just making that connection of, okay, if I have this client and they need legal services, who do I call instead of necessarily calling 911? Because that can be really dangerous. So um, I do things like that and um, even finding attorneys locally for people that handle um, intimate partner violence uh, or separations or, or things like that. So that's what I, I try to gather is I try to um, look at the practice as a whole and figure out what ways and what resources are needed to make it as safe as it needs to be. Well, I think it's so important. I mean, especially with me running the business consulting side, I always stress all the time, midwives only have so many hours in the day. We need to be great at being midwives. You have put your heart and soul and passion into this topic. This is your heart and soul that you, it makes no sense for one midwife to spend 20 hours when you can do it in a fraction of the time. You know the questions asked, you know the protocols, you have so many great resources. Like, I think that's what's so important and why I've created this channel in this networking community because I want midwives to lever the, leverage the experts in the community. And so, yeah, on the business side, I love to help people. And on the getting that side of their policies and protocols and screening, like you and I talked in a prior video, just a resource booklet. So they come prepared versus that that's something um, that's so time sensitive. So I think it's amazing what you're doing. Um, why don't you give a little background just to people that aren't as familiar with intimate partner violence, like the definition, the statistics that are out there, and why you've made this your life work? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the first thing, intimate partner violence, what it is, um, it's behavior by an intimate partner or ex-partner that causes physical, sexual, or psychological harm. Um, this includes physical aggression, sexual coercion, stalking, um, and psychological and emotional abuse. Uh, intimate partner violence is not the same as domestic violence, though domestic violence is the most used term. Uh, intimate partner violence can only happen between romantic partners um, or ex-partners, and those two people don't even have to be living in the same home. Whereas domestic violence happens between kind of anybody living under one roof. So it could be parents and children, cousins, grandparents, roommates. Domestic violence is violence among anybody living in the home. But what makes intimate partner violence different is the, the romantic and intimate connection makes, uh, makes the abuse a little bit more intricate when, when dealing with it. Well, and I think especially in pregnancy, I seen it brand new as a new graduate. Like I could tell a 16, 17 year old, whether it was recent or subconscious from a child, 
I could tell there wasn't anything taught. There was this instinctual, the trauma during the birth was so synced to that experience. Like my, I mean, honestly, my third birth, brand new graduate in Alaska was a 16 year old that had a fourth degree tear because of the trauma and the level of squeezing she did to her pelvis. Like, I just, I don't think there's enough credit given to how, like, I had no clue how to help her. Like, I, I just wish I would have known about you 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk about why you've specialized in pregnancy and that unique vulnerability time. Yeah, absolutely. So there, you know, people don't realize there are a lot of clinical implications to intimate partner violence during pregnancy. Um, you know, we're seeing things like hypertension and uh, gestational diabetes and all sorts of, like you said, birth trauma um, that, that is much higher risk because of these situations. And as we know about trauma, you know, it can be present or past. Um, and I think it's just so important that we recognize these clinical implications and prepare. You know, if, if we have somebody that comes in with an admitted history of hypertension in every pregnancy, we're going to be watching, right? We're going to be paying attention. We're going to offer solutions. Well, it's the same thing with intimate partner violence. It may not be a discussed situation between clients and, and their midwives, but if we're constantly watching for the signs and preparing for the outcomes, then we're going to be a step ahead because nobody wants, I know he's so wiggly right now. So I think I was like, he's looking for mama's food. He's hungry. Yes. It was so cute. <laughs> Hi, I see you. Um, you know, we don't want, we don't want to be caught unaware. And in, in birth, one of the main reasons that I chose this is because, um, as I mentioned in a, in a previous interview, the, there are 3 million women in the U.S. that are victims annually of intimate partner violence, and 324,000 of them are pregnant. And pregnancy for a lot of people in those relationships is the only time that they'll see even a provider. So it's important that those providers are, are ready. I guess as far as resources, I know you said part of your consulting services is to get those resources in their local community. So say a midwife's like, okay, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with my resources. I don't think I'm quite to the point of hiring you as a consultant to help with that aspect of their business. What are some great tips you have for national or local chapters, affiliations that they can go to? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So the biggest thing would be uh, local. You're going to want to hit local. Sorry, we're in a, we're in a fuss mood. Um, you're going to want to know local, local shelters first. Shelters are going to be really important and they're not a feasible option for everybody. That's something that, you know, I talk about in my courses. Um, but having walking over to the shelter or contacting the director and saying, knowing specifically what resources they offer. It's not enough to say, oh, there's a, there's a local domestic violence organization in my area. You have to know exactly what resources they offer. Do they offer legal help? Do they offer room and board? Um, some, some places people have to pay to stay there. So is there a cost um, associated with them? It's, those are the kinds of things that they're really going to want to look into. Um, is it religious based? Because not all, not all people are going to feel comfortable with that. So, so well, I think when you're talking about networking, I think it's shifting in a midwifery's mind. We we're so adamant. We got to connect with the specialist. We got to connect with the obstetrician, a family practice, a pediatrician. We need to shift our minds that this is part of our scope. And this is a very important um, it's more the social collaboration, not just the clinical collaboration. We really Absolutely. need to shift our mind of like when we're creating our network, it's not just who do we want to market that could refer to us, but it's reverse. Who are we going to want to refer to that's great for our women in the community? And so like I, I talk about chiropractors, I talk about doulas, childbirth educators, get to know them, get to know their services. One, you want to refer to a great credible place that you know is going to take good care of them. But two, you want, it, it, it's, it's, so I think that's one thing, especially with COVID. So many people are like, how do I network and how do I market? I was like, pick up a phone, 
Google yeah. search, find in the area. So yes, I, I really think that's a great way to get people to shift their mind, um, what resources are out there and, and have a good conversation, a Zoom call, get together yeah. when you can't, uh, when you can, when the lockdowns are over. Um, what are some other, oh, go ahead. Real quick, since you brought up COVID, I think it's really important to know too that rates of domestic violence have gone up um, nearly 40% with COVID and people are stuck at home with their abusers. And with that, shelters are at capacity. So that's another incredibly important reason why we should have these resources available because the last thing that somebody wants is to be able to you know have this situation and call a shelter and them say i'm sorry we have no room um is there a way for a midwife to know if a shelter is full besides just calling and asking every once in a while or i mean the biggest thing would be every every shelter is its own business they all run differently so i can't speak so like super general, general tips. Okay. but just calling and having that contact makes it one step easier in the event that they need to know, you know? Well, at so, least you can learn their historical trends of like, okay, we're always at 90%. We always have a waiting list. We always are right. open. Like at least then you can have an idea and vice versa that they call you like, oh my goodness, I know you work closely with women. We're getting to max capacity. I wanted to let you know. So then you have that relationship built. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I know this year has been with mental health aspect and just the intimate partner violence on an international level. I just... Midwives are struggling on so many levels to wear so many hats and that's why it's I'm so passionate and you're so passionate. How can we help midwives? How can we help the communities on a bigger level? And it's giving them tools, giving them resources, giving them that knowledge that they may get in school or they they may not. And so no, I think it's amazing what you're doing. Um, what are some other simple tips for midwives? Like if they're saying, okay, I, I, I need some extra education, I need to change my practice flow, what would be some simple things they could start implementing today? Um, I would say that like the very most important thing would be if you're sending home information like handouts on domestic violence or intimate partner violence, stop. That would be my most vital piece of information. Do not send home information about domestic violence. As, as general as it may be, and even if you give it to every single person in your practice, abusers are not logical. Abusers are going to see that potentially and say, I'm caught. And that is a huge, huge risk of escalation. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is don't send home information. Um, and the second thing is be creative with screening. Um, the, the very best screen available is the danger five assessment. And I would do the whole thing. Um, Asking the asking one question of are you you're safe at home, right? That is not a sufficient screen um, so take screening seriously and and you know only do it with the the client in the room um, And if that's not possible, then be creative put us, you know, put a note in the the urine dipstick box if, if your clients do their own screens or put a note somewhere where they have an opportunity to talk to you privately if they need to. Yeah, I think it was, I worked at a couple of great places. A good chunk would put it on the back of the door in the patient's bathroom because only the women would use that room. Um, and you could put like a, a thing to pull down as far as like just a number to call that they could put real tiny in their pocket or they could have a code. You could say, okay, tell your midwife. I mean, it's something that seemed nonchalant, but like, hey, you want to communicate about this and that'll flag to the midwife like to ask the partner to do something in the front or get something for you. So I think having like a way to inform communicate that this is a free space this is a place we we care about this and we want to make a direct conversation about it is great I think that's where I've seen it the most successful is in the clients in the bathroom that only they use not the family one yeah yeah and and you know at some some practices don't have that option some practices only have one yeah yeah and, so, and that's where you, you know, have to that, know yeah you have to know your practice and do you have a family bathroom it's or... all about being creative mm -hmm. um there are web oh hey this is really choppy i think we're 
Yeah, I was gonna say you're coming back. I think yeah, it says that it's actually on your end, but I think it's good now, so we're good. Um, but yeah, I, I think just reviewing what you were talking about, just the the bathroom and the situation. It doesn't make sense if you only have one bathroom. You can't say, oh no, the family can't use it because I put this special screening in it. You have to look at your situation. Maybe you have a pregnant resource area that she only like something. Maybe there's a childbirth education room or something that only the women go to. I I mean, yeah, you have to look at your situation and what's going to be not causing a red flag to somebody putting them more at risk. Like when you talked about the education, in, our mind, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I'm just helping out everybody. But if you look at it the other way, the, when it gets home and they see that packet, they, in their mind, they're thinking, you picked this out for her and it, it, you personally know something more than you do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some other simple things? I guess in my mind, knowing you brought up like, are you safe at home? What would be some ways to reframe questions um, during the conversation that that's more directive or do you standard ask during a first visit to have the partner separate for a while or do you take advantage of an opportunity when they go to the bathroom? Like how would be a, a consistent flow? Oh, I think I lost you, Cassandra. I think the internet's a little slow on your end. Can you hear me at all? Well, by Dr. Campbell, it's about 30 questions. Questions, the more specific they are, the better. Has your partner hit you? Um, has your partner pushed you? Has your partner said something that made you feel bad about yourself? The, there's a lot more to the answer than the verbal. Um, this is one of those moments where you're going to want to watch body language. Um, and, and really, again, you know, being creative. If, you, if you're not in a situation where you can ask those, you know, 35 questions, then it's all about... Uh, coming up with a code. Uh, for example, one idea would be um, if you have a pretty healthy clientele, which most midwives do, asking the question, um, you know, prefacing this in a conversation, um, I'm going to ask you how many sodas you've had. And if you feel like you're in danger, tell me you've had a soda. Most people are not drinking soda during pregnancy, right? So if the partner is in the room and, and you want to ask, but don't want him, them to know, than asking about soda, you know? Um, so there's ways to do it, but the biggest thing too is, is less about the screen and more just understanding that um, a client will come to you if they want to. And if they don't, then it can't be pushed. You know, pregnancy is not the time to push what you think somebody should do in this event. Well, I think there's just too many, there's hormonal changes, the, the family dynamics. She's not just vulnerable for herself, but she's vulnerable for a child. There's just, it's a very unique, women in general are vulnerable, but then you add the children and you add this vulnerable time where they're so dependent on that person. Um, it is, it's a very, it's, it's a tough, we want to advocate and empower women, but we have no idea what's going on. Like you said, we are only in their life for a short amount of time. And when they leave that door, we aren't there to protect them. Right, exactly. Dangerous time for uh, a person leaving domestic violence is the first first two years. That's the that's the most risk for homicide is leaving domestic violence. So, well, thank you so much. I could talk hours and hours with you, Cassandra. You're just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to do more conversations. And how can people reach you if they have questions, um, want to pick your brain, learn about your resources? Yeah. Um. Uh, so I right now. It sounds silly, but Facebook, my business page, uh, Midnight Midwifery on Facebook is going to be one of the fastest and easiest ways. Uh, my website is currently under construction as an ever evolving thing. Um, so all of my contact information um, is on my website, my phone number, um, and you know, messaging directly that way is a really great way. Um, my email also is midnightmidwifery at gmail.com. So that's a, I'm always checking my email. <laughs> 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much and you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, you too.